Okay. So before uh, starting uh, today's uh, lecture, so let me just kind of recap what we did uh, last time because it was a bit fast and uh, I indicated another proof of cross transformation formula which uh, I did not quite explain, but I think that's an important point. So you see, uh, let me recall, so I guess, um, we had this uh, Poisson summation formula. So we had this lattice gamma inside Rn. So this is an Euclidean lattice. And then we saw that uh, sum of f gamma, gamma in gamma is equal to one over volume of gamma uh, sum uh, f hat over k. k belongs to the dual lattice. Gamma star. So for, for suitable functions, F, that. Uh, um, so there is a kind of alternative way of writing this formula, which is suggested. And that is uh, the following. Uh, you can just uh, express this as uh, sum uh, Dirac delta functions shifted by uh, this uh, gamma, gamma belonging to gamma is equal to one over volume of gamma sum uh, Fourier transforms of uh, this uh, Dirac deltas at x minus k's, um, k belonging to gamma star. So we, so these two things are completely equivalent. Um, so what does this mean? This means that up to this uh, scaling, I uh, mean this factor normalization, the Fourier transform of uh, Dirac comb is a Dirac comb. So basically, so let me just introduce this Dirac comb. Uh, so I'm, we are looking at one dimensional case. So n is equal to one in this case, and gamma is equal to z, just a simple lattice. So these are uh, this uh, this is the Dirac comb. And uh, basically, the result says that if you take the Fourier transform uh, under the Fourier, it's, uh, it, the result is going to be again another Dirac comb. Okay. So that's uh, that's another way to think about it. Um, but I also indicated that the result is, is a bit even more general than that, right? So we can uh, write uh, a more general result when we just shift it by, uh, by, by amount x. So uh, the more general result would be something like this. So uh, I mean, this is a star. So this is a star prime. We can just say sum f of x plus gamma, the gamma belonging to gamma is equal to a one over volume gamma sum of uh, k belonging to gamma star um, of half of k. Uh, but then uh, you have to should not forget that we have shifted something by x here, right? 
So this is equal to exponential of 2 pi pi x dot k. Okay, so, so this is for uh, x belonging to uh, Rn. So this is a this is more general uh, than, than this one. Of course, if you put x equal to zero, you're going to get this one, right? This is a shifted version because we have shifted the function. The Fourier transform is gets multiplied by this character, and then the coefficients are the same. So, that's it. so um, anyhow, so no matter how you think about it, um, it's um, it's it's quite a surprising result, and it, it's important to have some uh, good understanding of why this is true. Um, um, so I indicated two proofs. Uh, last week, I mean, I gave more or less complete the first proof. The second proof was just, uh, just a uh, very, very rough sketch uh, idea. In fact, the second proof is, is the more important kind of idea involved in, in the second proof, which uh, gives this. So I, I want to, to kind of advertise now the following point of view. It's really for some summation formula, um, uh, is a trace order. Okay. The trace formula. Uh, in the following sense, um, in, in, in the sense that it says that a geometric trace of certain operator, a geometric trace. Uh, is equal to a spectral trace. So one side of the formula is geometric trace, we call it. And the other side is a spectral trace. And uh, so, I mean, a, a simplest version of this, like as I indicated, it's a linear algebra fact that some AIIs is equal to, um, uh, it's just some lambda i's. So for any kind of, for any n by n matrix, complex matrix, right? So this is kind of the most fundamental, the most basic kind of primordial uh, trace formula in mathematics, if you want. If you have a matrix A equal to AIJ, you will find that matrix, and uh, then you have this beautiful relation, sum on the diagonal and the sum on the uh, eigenvalues. So this formula, I said that can be seen in the light of this formula. So what we have to do, we have to find an appropriate operator A, uh, which is not going to be a matrix, uh, but it's an infinite matrix. And then uh, we will apply the, this, this result, this idea of that operator, and then this will come up. So this is a very good way of understanding this uh, um, Poisson summation formula or trace formulas in general. So what is that operator A now that uh, we want? So I also indicated that uh, F gives us this operator A, which is, uh, um, an, which is an integral operator. It's, it's this operator, let me put it like this, um, A, of uh, so this is like um, maybe yeah I would say AF but AF of G is equal to F from all the G so this is this AF goes from L2 of uh, Rn mod gamma to L2 of Rn of gamma. Um, so uh, what does this mean, uh, the convolution? So AFG at x is equal to uh, integral over R. We just use convolution over R first, right? 
for R at F of, um, you can say, X minus Y, G of Y, DY is equal to uh, integral of um, um, yeah, I mean, okay, so this is, this is, this is the balance for that. It's just it's not now. I, okay, so now the only thing that we have to, um, so, be, so because we have lifted this function uh, g, which is uh, in L2 of R mod, Rn mod gamma to Rn, so this is Rn, by the way, and then uh, it, it, it's a periodic function uh, upstairs. And then uh, we are uh, multiplying by this function and integrating. So the only thing that we have to worry about is that the integral is convergent. It, it is because uh, this f has decay at infinity. That's fine. And also you have to make sure that this is again a periodic function, which it is because uh, g is periodic. So this is good. Um, this, is a, this is our operator now. This is our operator. Uh, so, but then uh, we want to claim that this is a trace class operator. AF is, uh, in fact, um, is, is an integral operator with a, a smooth kernel, uh, which is, is an integral operator. Integral operator. Smooth scale. So, why is that so? Uh, in fact, uh, if you translate this and using periodicity of this function g, um, you, you can see that you can write this as integral over one period, one fundamental domain, and then translates of this fundamental domain. So what I'm saying is that uh, you can actually check that. That's not difficult. Uh, AF G X is equal to sum gamma belonging to gamma. Um, integral over uh, our f of gamma uh, f of x minus y um, minus gamma times um, times uh, g of y uh, dy. If you do that, then uh, we can bring this inside. So we notice that then there is going to be an integral kernel here, uh, which is going to be sums of these things. Okay, so actually I can put gamma here. So then what we get is that. Um, a f of g as x is equal to integral r n over gamma k of x and y g of y y where k of x and y is the sum of x minus y plus gamma, uh, gamma in gamma. So this is the kernel. So this kernel is is, is on a smooth function. Um, it's it's periodic, and um, so this is an integral operator with a smooth kernel. So we know that then uh, as a result. This operator is trace class, and we know what the trace is. So, in F is trace class. Um, yes. We 
it uh, trace of it is equal to um, uh, okay, so integral over R n over gamma um, k x x dx. And this is exactly the left hand side, is, is the geometric side of, of the operator, right? Of, 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 of the formula. So if you evaluate this, uh, so if you put x equal to y, you're going to get constant f of gamma. So then volume of this uh, thing pops out. So that's equal to volume of Rn over gamma. Uh, and then sum of f of gammas. And this is what we call volume of the lattice, right? So this is the volume of the lattice. Volume of uh, gamma. It's better to call it co-volume of the, of the lattice because it's a volume of the quotient, but that's okay. Call it volume. Okay, so this is the left hand side of uh, Poisson summation. So that's not bad because uh, it, it looks like we are getting somewhere because we, we produce the left hand side exactly as this uh, trace map. Uh, now, what about the right hand side? So we still have to see those eigenvalues uh, coming uh, from um, this thing. Now, um, well, there is a there is a basis or a normal basis for uh, this ultra of R and Y gamma. So normal, normal basis, uh, which consists of characters, uh, of characters. So these characters, uh, I mean, these functions are exponential of two pi i x dot gamma uh, dot k's. Now k belong to gamma star. So this is this is normal base. That's that's the promise of proving the theory for us. Uh, that this is indeed the normal basis. Um, Okay, so then um, let's compute. Uh, I, I claim that actually these characters are eigenfunctions of this operator. So claim is that uh, these uh, characters are eigenfunctions. Uh, so, so it's it's a very general uh, kind of slogan. It's good to remember this: character or eigenfunctions of um, convolution operators. At least in this case, of course. Um, maybe these guys are not orthonormal, but that's okay as long as they are eigenfunctions. That's okay because. The scale doesn't matter. We are, we are, we are going after um, eigenvalues now. And because this is a basis, we want to find the eigenvalues, we can sum them and get this result, analog of this result. And we are okay. So let's compute then AF over these guys. The f of these characters, the f of this function e two pi i x dot k. I mean, my notation is really now not very good, but you understand. <laughs> Maybe I should put something like f x is the k character. So this is uh, by definition that we have. This is integral over. Uh, R n uh, f of um, 
x minus y uh, e to the um, two pi i x cos k, then there is dx right? or dy or dk. I'm sorry, this is uh, no, no, no. What, what am I doing? What is where is y e to the uh, two pi i maybe k, and then here should be k, right? And this is dk. Are we okay? Oh, no, no, no. I have to integrate over x minus y and e to the 2 pi i yeah. y k. Exactly. Y. Okay, that's absolutely correct. This is uh, because of this notation is not very, very effective. Then there is this dy, right? Now what we are going to do, we're going to change variable here. So this is equal to also integral uh, f of x e to the two pi i. Um, I would say x minus y. Um, so this is, um, Point is the sum of these two things should be x. So uh, here, if I put uh, maybe I just put y. I'm not sure what I'm doing now. So this is x minus y dot k. This is dy. How is it? No, no, no. no. So, no, 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 K is fixed, that's okay. I mean, the sum of these two variables should be X. And the sum of these two is also X, and K is okay. This is okay. It's the usual thing with convolution, right? But now, because this is a character, or in this case, indeed the exponential, uh, we can just uh, simplify this. This is equal to, uh, so e to the two pi i X, x uh, dot k, which we're not integrating, and then times integral f of y exponential of minus 2 pi r um, um, what? x dot k, right? Uh, no, uh, y dot k, sorry. Uh, and then we've got dy. And if you remember, this is exactly the Fourier, uh, um, the value of the Fourier, uh, not Fourier integral of f at this character, particular character, uh, at this particular point k. So this is really, over Rn. so this is really a half of k. Okay. So that's it. So, so it follows that this is is a so k belonging to gamma star is an or is a complete is, is an orthogonal basis of L two. Of R and of gamma. Uh, not only that, uh, but it's actually a basis of eigenfunctions for uh, our operator. So the, the, the operator is now diagonalized on this uh, basis uh, and of eigenfunctions of the F. So we have diagonalized, in fact, if you go to the spaces of uh, characters, you have diagonalized your operator now completely. I mean, this, is, this is beautiful because uh, then you can compute trace spectrally, and then uh, it's going to be sums of this one. So spectrally trace. Of A now 
So this, so this, this thing I, I can call lambda k, right? K belonging to the dual lattice. So this is equal to sum of lambda k's, and this is equal to sum of uh, half of k. K belonging to uh, k's. So yes. This, this approach is beautiful because it really uh, shows, uh, it fits our general philosophy that the trace formula is just an incarnation of this fact that geometric trace should be equal to uh, this spectral trace. There are two sides, geometric side and a spectral side, and they should be, um, they should be equal. Uh, so in each case, of course, you have to find the setting that would uh, would be appropriate to apply this machine. But one of, one of the one of the lessons, of course, here is that um, one of the lessons is that I mean this is very valuable to remember that characters are eigenfunctions of computation objects, and um, and the values of Fourier transform on the character are in fact eigenvalues of that object. So this is. Uh, so you, you can approach Fourier series completely from the point of view of uh, diagonalizing convolution operators also. That's, uh, that's what uh, the message is. Now, um, there is, um, so now, so this point of view um, is very interesting it's still because it can be further generalized. And uh, you, you want to uh, really generalize this to many, many different other situations. So, I mean, one generalization is you can go to locally compact abelian groups, actually. So, this is a Poisson summation formula holds for locally compact. Abelian groups. I mean, this is a, this is a very important uh, observation, and uh, more or less the proof I gave here carries over to this general case. So, what is it? Uh, what is this uh, general case? I mean, you can even consider um, uh, if G is, is a locally compact abelian group, locally compact uh, abelian group. You can uh, fix a subgroup of this, which is closed. Closed subgroup. And such that the quotient, uh, so, so these are the assumptions. Also, the third assumption is that this quotient should be compact. You see, all these three assumptions are, are, are satisfied in our case. You see, we have like R, we have this Z, which is discrete in this case, and we have R not Z, which is compact, etc. It was the first case, but then for Rn also something like that. Okay, but this is much more general, very general. So then, uh, basically, uh, what happens is that um, um, you can relate um, summing over this. So I mean that sum then for so let me put it like this then for suitable. Okay, so so uh, yeah, so then for suitable um, f from G to C. Uh, we can write integral f of h dh over h. And this is this is a hard measure for this subgroup h is equal to an um, integral f of chi uh, hat of chi. I'm just now using some notation d chi. Chi belongs to G mod H hat. 
So, so, so let me maybe quickly introduce this notation. So first of all, what is G hat? This G hat can be defined for any locally compact Abelian group. This G hat uh, is the dual group. Uh, this is uh, the set of all chi's from G to unitary group one dimension U1, such that a chi is a group homomorphism. Chi is a group homomorphism. So, in other words, these are exactly irreducible representations of G. Since G is abelian, irreducible representations are one dimensional. You know that. And we are just taking uh, the set of all ereps of G. And obviously, they form a group. And then you can put a topology here. I think compact open topology. So this is a map from here to there. So you can put a function space topology on that. And there are some results that show that this G hat is, again, a locally compact abelian group. It's, again, LCA. Okay, so this, this, this works, this exists. Uh, so EG, for example, let me just give you some, some uh, situation. I mean, if you have like cyclic group of order N, uh, then the dual, in this case, again is a cyclic group of order N, in this case, you can check. This is the case. If G is R, then G hat is Z. Or in fact, if you have Rn, then this is Zn. Oh, that's all. I'm sorry. It's Rn. Oh my god. What am I doing? Crying. G is Rn, or R, it's dual again, is, is, is the same. Uh, but if G is a torus, for example, uh, Tn, then uh, G hat is Z. This is, 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 is the lattice Zn. Or in, in fact, if uh, G is Rn over a lattice, then you can say that this G hat is dual lattice. Uh, but this is a kind of uh, everything coincides and you don't see that. Uh, Anyhow, so this, this thing you can compute, but there are other interesting examples coming from number theory, which uh, we don't need uh, to discuss. But uh, like periodic numbers and adults and adults, and they, they give a lot of nice examples of this. But now, uh, what we need to do is, I just have to tell you what this Fourier transform is in this very, very general context now. It's not the most general, but it's it. much more general than the Fourier transform. So then uh, this f hat is a function from g hat to a c. The c Fourier transform is a function on the space of characters. What is it? So a hat of uh, a character chi is given by integral f of g by g or the G over G. This is the general Fourier transform, right? Okay, so if you understand everything in this slide, then um, this formula still has to be uh, kind of, uh, I have to tell you exactly uh, what is the hard measure thing? So the, the, the message is that if you fix a hard measure on G to define your Fourier transform, you need that. And if you fix a hard measure on H in order to define this FH, I mean this integral uh, over H, then the claim is that there exists a hard measure, suitable hard measure, not an arbitrary, a suitable hard measure here on this uh, group, totally compact. Such that this formula holds. 
So that one over volume gamma factor is absorbed into uh, this R measure that I'm saying exists here, but this has to be checked. Uh, except for uh, this sort of uh, difficulties about defining this right class of functions and these things, uh, the proof again is very, very similar. So we just take this convolution operator and we compute this trace in two ways. And so, we get that. so this is one of the, uh, this is a really a nice, very, very nice result. So, um, let me show you how to this for. Any questions? Or? Of course, this is not the end of the story. I mean, this has been generalized again further to non-abelian groups. So we'll see that in the case of non-abelian groups, maybe next uh, survey test for them. And uh, it has also been extended to, um, even, even over R, if, you, if, if, if the step that you're summing over is not a lattice, it's something like less than a lattice, uh, some kind of quasi-lattice, then uh, you run into very, very interesting deep analytic issues immediately uh, to generalize this result. And uh, this is, yeah, this is kind of has another importance which uh, I don't want to talk about. So I, I think now, I think now we have a better uh, kind of grasp of this summation formulas uh, or trace formulas, uh, which is this one. But of course, um, there, there was another aspect uh, to this. We apply this result to a particular function after all. Right? And we apply this to Gaussians. So, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a different industry. This is a very general result for any f. And then for suitable f, uh, you get beautiful formulas like functional equation for theta function. Right? Uh, next uh, step was use f of x equal to e to the minus pi norm of x squared. And then we got a functional equation, functional equation uh, for uh, data functions. Uh, so yeah, so this was, uh, and, and gamma, for example, self dual. Gamma equal to gamma star. Then we got, I mean, in general, we got a formula that relates theta function for lattice and uh, another theta function for the dual lattice. And um, right, so that that really opens uh, opened the whole new world for us because that also said that suggested that uh, the spectral side was really quantum mechanical spectrum. In that case, got that the spectral side was sums of, of um, over, I mean, uh, over spectrum of this Hamiltonian quantum one. Uh, but then geometric side, Uh, was a sum over uh, lengths of periodic uh, geodesics. So lengths of periodic geodesics. So this did it. Uh, I don't want to write it again because. Um, so this was a. Uh, um, uh, okay, I mean, this opens up the whole new issue of uh, relating the uh, spectrum of uh, quantization of your classical system to the spectrum, latest spectrum of the original system. Okay, that's, uh, that's something maybe uh, next time we can we should look at it more carefully and uh, see how this can be generalized. But in this case, it was a very special case for the flat torus, but we, we, are, we are interested in knowing how far this result can be generalized to general Riemannian manifold because the problem makes sense it exists for general Riemannian manifold, compact Riemannian manifold. 
Okay, so uh, I think uh, that's good now. Any questions? Okay, so this uh, um, of course we did this stuff in order to study heat kernel for for Torah after all was needed for, for Torah. So now I'm going to uh, talk about another application of heat kernel, which is this Atiyapat Lefschet fixed point formula. I don't think we can finish the proof today, but certainly next week. Let's set it up. Sure, oh, there is a there is a question in the chat. Are you muted? No, it's just saying that I have to leave a little early. And sorry about being late. Oh, I see. So yeah, yeah, you're uh, you're there. Okay, okay, I got you. Uh, so I need to. Okay, close. Yeah, all right. So, um, um, so this is uh, now a tier point. Uh, Uh, fixed point formula. So this result um, was inspired, uh, I mean, by 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 the result of Lefschetz, but it's it has a very different form. Uh, rather different form. Uh, so let me recall this Lefschet fixed point formula. Um, so so imagine you have a um, X, which is a um, compact, uh, I would say finite CW complex. Um, so it follows that if you look at cohomology groups of X, right, with coefficients in R, um, these are actually zero for Q bigger than some number N. Um, so, so, I mean, just to, to, to be uh, you know, on the safe side, I mean, you can take maybe, if you feel more comfortable, take X to be a uh, compact manifold. You could have a boundary if you want, but it should be compact. Then you have this condition that for large, large cubes, this is zero. And for all cubes, these guys are finite dimensional. This we know from general results. And it's finite dimensional. This enough. Okay, and that's what we need. Um, so now let f be a function, uh, just a continuous map, say. This map. Then uh, the Lifshitz number of this map Lifshitz number 
of this map f is um, so what you can do you can take alternating sums um, you can take action of this f on cohomology because it, it acts on cohomology it, it acts on x so it acts on cohomology by pull back but so you can take action of f on cohomology that goes from hg of x to itself right and you can take trace of this map right and alternate i from zero to something uh, these are the finite dimensional vector spaces and these are maps from hq to hq you can take its trace can take alternating sums, and this is the left shift's number of the map. So left shifts prove the following theorem. I mean, you prove several results about these things. One of them was this, I think. Left shifts. Was that um, if left shift's number is not zero, Uh, then uh, this map has a fixed point. Then F has a fixed point. So this is this is quite remarkable, right? I mean, from the action of this F on study of Lefschetz number, you can infer something about fixed points of this. So fixed point is a point such that, of course. F x equal to x, right? Um, so let me show you that uh, this result actually implies Brouwer's fixed point formula. So um, the result is uh, here that uh, um, um, So, so then uh, corollary I mean, of this is Brouwer's six-point formula. So uh, is that so? What was the Brouwer six-point formula? If F is a continuous map from disk to disk. n-dimensional disk uh, ball to itself continues, uh, then this guy has a fixed point. Uh, then F has a fixed point. F has a fixed point. So how does it how does it work? Uh, how does this uh, result work? I mean, how does it follow from uh, lectures well i mean for bn hq so bn is contractible right it's contractible so it means that all those cohomology groups uh, and it's and it's connected so uh, so all those cohomology groups are zero in positive dimensions and because it's connected, so a zero of Pn is isomorphic to R. So that's that's uh, this map. Um, now, so so what is Lefschetz number? It's just um, trace of F. Start uh, going from uh, H zero from H zero of the end itself. There's only one term in this sum, right? There's only one term in the sum. Uh, so, but this is not zero. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, is equal to um, is not zero. I mean, this you can show that actually this is equal to um, maybe it's equal to one. Or one. Uh, 
so anyhow, this number cannot be zero. Um, there is an easy proof of this. Uh, it's not uh, difficult. I mean, it's it's it, it's a one-dimensional vector space, so. If trace uh, has to be zero, then the map itself has to be zero. That's uh, clear. Uh, but so wh why the action of a star on a zero is not zero? Um, you can just take any representative, uh, and then if, if you take a representative like a point, any, any point can represent a zero uh, because it's contractible. So it's so that point is mapped somewhere else, but that point is homotopic to this point. You can connect. So it means that it's actually identity. That zero is really identity. So this is really this case, actually. So it's different from zero. In fact, it's one. So then uh, Lepschitz applies. So Lepschitz implies Brow. Okay, so he did really uh, generalize this Brouwer. I think one of one of his points was to generalize Brouwer. So it's going to. Work. By the way, about this Lefschetz number, I should tell you that, of course, if you have identity map, this Lefschetz number is just Euler characteristic. So this is generalization of Euler characteristic. Right? So L of identity is equal to Euler characteristic of X. Right? Why is it that? Because if you have identity. Then you have identity maps here. Our trace of identity is just dimension of the space. Right? So this is this is plain from the definition. It's clear that uh, in that case, uh, um, that's what you have. Okay. Now let me quickly indicate how the proof goes because it, the proof is actually. We don't need the proof actually, because uh, but but uh, let me just quickly begin how the proof goes because it's it's kind of fun to know this proof. Mm. Um, so there is so the proof goes like this. Um, I mean, it's not totally um, obvious because you have to use something, right? I mean, uh, uh, proof of legends. Uh, is point formula. Uh, so first of all, uh, you have to take a cell decomposition of your, uh, or simplicial decomposition of, uh, so pick, a cell decomposition or simplicial decomposition okay so we know that this exists because i assume even x is cw complex but i mean just for you yourself so you start with a bunch of points and then you have uh, some intervals and then you add some triangles, and then you add, you add some uh, three-dimensional tetrahedrons. I mean, uh, like so on. Zero-dimensional, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional objects. You glue them together uh, to construct your space out of these uh, cells or uh, or or, or, or um, uh, simply uh, simply things like that. You can you can. Do that uh, now. This is a uh, there is a result which I have to use. This is simplicial approximation theorem. It's a very classic um, result of algebraic topology. 
that says that any f can be homotoped into a simplicial map, any continuous f can be homotoped. In other words, you can, you can change it within the same homotopy class to a simplicial map. We can assume it's simply simplicial means that it, 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 it preserves this, uh, uh, this the composition structure. So this map so simplicial. It's, it's appropriate to that category. Now, if this map does not have a fixed point, if f of x um, is different from x for all x. So remember, we are assuming that the uh, Lefschetz number is not zero, and we want to show that the um, thing has a fixed point. So we go by contradiction. If the map does not have a fixed point, of x is different from x, for all x belongs to x, uh, then uh, there is a minimum of distance between x and f of x. Right? So let uh, d equal to minimum of uh, the distance between x and f of x, uh, minimum of these numbers, x belonging to x. So this, this guy is positive. Okay. So then what you can do, you can actually um, uh, go into finer uh, simplicial decomposition, then refine your Simplicial decomposition. The final one. So we have this triangle originally. Could be that the distance uh, between two points here is more than D, but I can decompose it into smaller triangles such that the distance between any two points here is actually uh, less than D. We can do that by this thing. So now the distance, to the diameter, I guess that's the word, diameter, or diameter of any piece is going to be less than D. Uh, so you can do it for um, intervals and high dimensional ones as well, right? So you can do that. Okay, now use this finer simplicial decomposition to compute the homology. We can do that, right? Uh, use this finer piece to compute the finer uh, simplicial decomposition. Compute uh, the cohomology, the cohomologies. We know that it's independent of choice of simplicial complex. Uh, this is observed by Euler, for example, in some case. And then now we have to use some uh, beautiful uh, piece of linear algebra, which I mentioned in the first lecture, maybe second lecture, uh, which now I'm going to mention again. Uh, so then use the, uh, it, it's a beautiful fact of linear algebra, the linear algebra fact. What is this linear algebra fact? It's the following. I, I may, imagine you have a chain complex. So imagine you have a chain complex. Okay. Um, finite dimensional, or all these groups, uh, all these co-chains are finite dimensional vector spaces. Um, right. And uh, assume that there is a chain map. 
f from ci. I, mean, I, I say c bullet to c bullet is a chain map. I should say co chain map, but that doesn't matter. So it means bf equal to fp. Right? So now let's look at the left shift's number of this map acting on c and acting on cohomology of c. So the left shift's number of f acting on c, well, this is what, what, what we defined uh, before on the level of cohomology, but you can do it for any kind of vector spaces like this minus one to the i, uh, trace of uh, f acting from ci to itself over i, right? So this is uh, this number, Lefschetz number. And you can also act, uh, you can also consider the action of f uh, on cohomology. Because of this chain condition, this guy acts on cohomology as well, right? So you can form the Lefschetz number on cohomologies i minus one to the power i trace of h of f acting from, uh, well, I mean, I would say f star. Maybe. I think from cohomology in I, so I cohomology of the complex to itself, right? So these two numbers are finite numbers, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we call them Lefschetz numbers of these uh, these actions. Now the, the claim is that this number and that number are the same. <laughs> so claim. Is that LFC is equal to LF? So F star here, I put F star acting on cohomology. So this is a beautiful fact. It's pure linear algebra. I mean, I want you to prove this. Remember, I mean, this, uh, if L is identity, I mean, sorry, if F is identity map. This is just Euler characteristic of the complex, and this is Euler characteristic of its cohomology. So this is, just goes back to Euler. I mean, the formula um, V minus E plus F equal to two is a very, very special case of this, right? Uh, this linear algebra fact, plus those uh, topological considerations. Okay, so once you, um, uh, prove this, which you have to prove it. This is completely linear algebra. Now we can use it towards this. So the left shift's number now can be computed either by going to cohomology or by looking at the level of uh, uh, just the original decomposition. But let's see what happens now. Um, it's off diagonal. What's that? It's off diagonal. It's all off diagonal. Exactly. That's the point. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. As you notice, uh, look, notice. Uh, yeah. But now, this F is going to move all these uh, simplices now because the distance uh, is bigger than D. So you cannot send the small simplices into the same thing. It, it has to go into something else. It has to go into another simplex. Since um, D of f of x and x is bigger than is bigger than this D, right? Which was uh, the um, so this was basically um, supremum of this uh, all these uh, things. So this implies that f moves. Really, literally moves all synthesis. into a different simplex. Into different uh, simplex. Okay, so they are off diagonal, i.e., the matrix of this F is off diagonal. F is off diagonal. Okay, now if you use this fact, 
uh, to com compute the Lipschitz number on cohomology, I can compute the Lipschitz number on synthesis, but Lipschitz number on synthesis we just proved is zero, right? So it cannot be that the Lipschitz number is original Lipschitz number is non zero. So let me write it here. Yeah. So this is the idea. So the matrix of F in the basis C is really here is those zeros. So this implies that the largest number of F uh, on C on the original is equal to zero. And this linear algebra implies that the largest number of F on cohomology is zero. And this is contradiction with what we assume. We assume that this largest number is not zero. So, yeah, this is um, this is the argument. Uh, I believe it's original argument. Of the okay. So any questions? The original distance method, the notion of distance from x. Yeah. Um, so just any distance notion. You can you can pick any metric you want. That's okay. And uh, well, I mean, you, you cannot pick uh, any metric. So I mean, metric that's compatible with the topology. So you can embed your thing inside Rn and pick the induced metric. I mean, for example, don't choose discrete metric. This would be just completely crazy. <laughs> or chaotic <the> metrics. <laughs> should be totally disconnected. <laughs> but that's not bad. Okay, so that's very good. So now I can uh, so start. If you don't have any questions, I can start. Uh, so about at your bot. So at your bot uh, result, um, it's uh, it's it's in the same vein, but uh, uses ideas of heat equation and it's proof at least. It uses ideas of heat equation and this thing. So that's quite. Uh, so this is at your bot. Um, I think it's more important. Okay, so the setting is like the index theory setting that we had. So let's assume that MB is a closed. Oriented Riemannian manifold. And uh, we're going to uh, fix an elliptic complex over, over um, uh, so we have this sequence of vector bundles. Bundles. over M and we have this elliptic complex and so maybe E and And we have this operator, I just call it D because it doesn't matter really. So this is an elliptic complex. So this is setting that we did index theory for. I mean, still we have, we have to prove the index theorem, uh, but uh, we are uh, looking at this concept from different point of view now, so elliptic. Um, okay, so um, then uh, what we want to do, um, let us take a map from M to M, a smooth map, let F from M to M. A smooth map uh, 
So we have to assume uh, that this map uh, is, um, its fixed points is uh, non-degenerate. So let me tell you in what sense we non-degenerate fixed points. So I'll tell you in what sense I mean non-degenerate fixed points. So, so by this, we mean the following thing. Look at M cross M. Okay. So you look at M cross M and you look at diagonal of uh, this guy. So this is diagonal of M. And look at the graph of M. Okay, so, so the graph of M is some sub-manifold like that here, right? So graph of M, oh, sorry, graph of M. F, I'm sorry, graph of F. So this, no, no, this is delta of F, this was okay. This is delta of M, but this one is graph of F. Graph of F is the set of all X and F of X, of course, is a graph, right? Where X belongs to M. And this is the inside M cross M. Uh, so what are fixed points? Fixed points are exactly points of intersection, right? Of graph. So fixed points is equal to the points of uh, intersection of uh, diagonal with graph. So that's, uh, that's, the, that, that's a set of fixed points. Now, what we are saying is that the condition of non-degenerate is that uh, these two, uh, and, and of course, this is a submanifold. This graph is also a submanifold, and delta of m is also a submanifold. Of this. What we are saying is that at each point that they intersect, uh, they intersect in a transversal way. So, uh, intersect uh, transversally. That's the word. So what does transversal mean? Transversal means that, okay, if you look at the tangent space to uh, this submanifold at that point, and the tangent space to diagonal, which is this one, these two things uh, together, um, they generate uh, this, uh, this uh, space, um, uh, tangent space of n cross n. So the tangent space to gamma of f creates some um, plus tangent space of this uh, delta and tangent space of and at each fixed point x. Uh, okay, so uh, so so they cannot be tangent to each other, for example. If they are tangent, for example. If they share some parts, maybe one dimensional subspace, they, they, they cannot, you cannot, uh, because this is n dimensional, this is also n dimensional. So, for this to be true, that this has to be a DX decomposition uh, by dimension arguments. So, this is transversality. So, this is the condition that uh, we need. Uh, so, of course, if you have transversality, you see uh, at each neighborhood uh, of this fixed point, there's only just that fixed point. There cannot be other fixed points. Okay? So fixed points are isolated. So this non-degenerate condition implies that fixed points are isolated. There may be no, no fixed point. I mean, that's quite possible, but yeah, so it's, it's a fixed points are isolated. And because, there are, because the, the, the manifold is compact, so there's going to be finite number of fixed points. So this implies that finite uh, number of fixed points. Of course, that's a very easy consequence of this transversality, but we will use it in, in a much, uh, much more serious way. So a finite number of um, fixed points. Okay. So we have that. Um, Okay, so now what is the Lefschetz number in this case? Uh, and uh, what we want to do? 
with this uh, Lipschitz number. Um, so, okay, um, we need, of course, I can take cohomology of these guys, but um, so so this so now here is the situation. You have these vector bundles over M, and you have these maps. Uh, so we have this map from on the base, right? This f sends x to f x, right? Um, but this map uh, does not act on on, on these spaces uh, in in some uh, obvious way, right? Um, you see, in, in the case of Lefschetz numbers, uh, we, we looked at action of this uh, map on uh, cohomology, action of this F on chain complex, or, and then we related uh, that to um, these fixed points being zero, uh, being uh, empty set or non empty set. So we need some uh, something. So, but here so we can do something. So let me tell you what we can pull back those bundles uh, along that map f first of all right so maybe i just erase this part i think that's it so we can pull back each ei to this bundle of star of ei right so if you look at for example the fiber of this bundle over n. So this is, again, is a vector bundle over n, right? So if you look at this fiber, uh, so this is for r, all r i's, you can do that. So if you look at fiber of this guy over n, what is it? This is fiber of e i over f of n. In, 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 in a canonical way, actually. So the fiber of this pullback bundle is exactly E i uh, on F of M, right? So we have a map of um, 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 bundles now, right? From F star of E i, right? To 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 E I. Um, actually, it's the other way around that we have. So we have this map from E I to F star of E I. This guy is E I. Um, what do I have? Uh, what do I need? So I have to fix this map now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, so indeed, yes, we do have a map from C infinity of, uh, so from here, so we get a map from C infinity of EI, smooth sections of this guy to, um, to C infinity of uh, F star of EI. You see, if you have a map of bundles like that, then you get a map of sections like that because if you have a section here, I mean, you can you can attach a section um, at over each point, uh, fiber over each point, pick a vector there, or I mean, pick vector of the section at that point, and then use your vector bundle map to move it into the other one, and that's your section at that point, the value of the section at uh, 
at n in the new bundle. So we have this map. Uh, but what we don't, but but we need a, but we want to have a map from C infinity of E i to C infinity of E i. So that's something that uh, Thiebaud decided to postulate its existence. It's not guaranteed. So what you just put, so assume that this exists, this map exists, first of all, but exists such that, so this map, I don't know, maybe I call it J or something, but such that if you look at this composition, which called F, such that uh, this composition F, F uh, is a morphism of complexes. F is a morphism So, I mean, this is for each i, right? Okay, so if, if, you, if, you, if you allow yourself existence of such a map j from each c infinity of the star of the i, uh, such that this composed map is a morphism of complexes, um, so f d equal to d f, I mean, after all, I mean, this elliptic complex, everything that we know, I mean, it, it's just a complex after all. It is an infinite dimensional complex, right? So now uh, you can look at the action of this uh, on cohomology. So we have got here C infinity of E0 F D C infinity of one D, D, C infinity of zero. So we have this map. So now we can look at the action of this guy uh, on, on, on cohomology, and then we can define the Lefschetz number uh, of this. So uh, the Lefschetz number of. So my notation, my notion, what notation I use. Um, so yes, the Lefschetz number of F and J, I, I call this J. So Lefschetz number of F, pair F and J is equal to sum minus one to the power of I, I from zero up to N, a trace of F I star, Acting from the white cohomology of this uh, elliptic complex to itself. So, this is a very much like a Lefschetz number of this morphism of complexes. It's just uh, exactly the same. Of course, I mean, it's infinite dimensional, uh, but uh, cohomologies are finite dimensional. So, this cohomology uh, Lefschetz number is defined. What is not defined is uh, the Lefschetz number on the level of these vector spaces because these are infinite dimensional things and we don't know how to take traces of that, right? So, but this number exists. This number exists. So, that's one side of the um, formula. The other side is we attach to each fixed point a number which is going to be uh, this number. Um, so for any x point, x, x um, we attach this number. So I don't know what's my notation for this number. Is um, yes, it's going to be equal to um, 
trace of um, this map, trace of um, JQ from um, EQ uh, at X to um, EQ at X. You see, because X and F of X coincide, so I, I, I'm allowed to go from fiber at X to fiber at X again. Otherwise, you will go from fiber at X to fiber at F of X, but here the same. Divided by, and remember, of course, this is a finite dimensional vector space, right? So we can take trace. Divided by the determinant of one minus uh, the derivative of F at the point F. And um, we have to take absolute values. So remember, this f is, is all acting on the base, right? So it goes from m to m, right? And so because uh, f of x is equal to x, so it acts from tangent space to tangent space. So df at x goes from tangent space to tangent space. So suddenly it goes from some same same space to itself. And transversality means that this determinant is not zero. Because there can't be any eigenvalue one. I mean this this, this, this determinant is not transversality. Means that this determinant is not zero. Okay, so now the result uh, that I'm going to prove uh, is root vector by this form is, is the following. Um, that this left shifts number, so now we have these guys here. So it says that this left shifts number of f and j is a, is a sum over all fixed points f of x equal to x and for each fixed point you have to do uh, this sum from q from 1 to n so sum take alternating sums of these contributions minus 1 to the q q from 0 to n these numbers trace of um, um, JQ of EXQ to EXQ divided by one minus absolute value of determinant of one minus DFX. That's the uh, that's the two. So, um, um, okay, so I think uh, I just need five minutes to give a very good example of this and then we finish. Uh, before I, I, I'm not going to prove it today because um, it's, it needs uh, some um, preparation using heat kernels. I mean, we're going to use heat kernels, uh, and um, from the, there are at least two proofs. I mean, the original proof is not based on heat kernels, they use some sort of distribution uh, arguments, uh, which is also interesting. But the heat kernel proof they found later is also very interesting. So, I'm going to Give that proof. Um, uh, so let's look at some example. One example of this, at least. Any questions? All right. So let's let me look at one uh, example.
So this is actually a corollary. So this corollary is, is, a, is a result, it's a famous result due to Lefschetz and Hoff. Uh, so this is Lefschetz uh, Hoff fixed point here. So what is this? So imagine you have a um, smooth uh, closed manifold. Um, um, So, um, so then uh, to fix points of uh, this F, we can attach a, a number. Uh, I don't know what that number is called. It's um, so for any fixed point. I mean, we are again assuming these fixed points are non degenerate for any fixed point X, so X non degenerate. Um, we attach just uh, one number, which is uh, one or minus one. Um, Oh, that's called the index of that point, right? So I think that that number is called the index of that fixed point. I believe this is called index. Index of f at x is equal to um, I believe it should be um, So let me call it just sine of the determinant, sine of the determinant of one minus bf x. Okay. It, it's just, I mean, it's either plus one or minus one, okay? So just two numbers only can, can take the values. The sine of the determinant, because it's a real number, non-zero by assumption. So we, we just pick the sign. Then the result says that um, oh no, that's um, um no, sorry. So uh, I want I want to say like this, something like that. So. Sum of indices of F uh, at X, X belonging to um, X points of uh, F. Is equal to, uh, I believe, uh, sum over this guy. It's uh, so this is this is the result. Um, this this is this is this is what we want to prove. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That was uh, my my original definition of index of of that fixed point was not quite correct. Was not correct at all. So this is, so what, what is the situation in this case? So in this case, of course, we have an elliptic complex, which is the Brown complex, right? So proof. Um, sorry, what's the index, the I of f of x? 
Uh, Not some. Right. So I will define it as I will go on. Okay. Uh, I have to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, right. So uh, who is uh, apply until what? I mean, I can tell you uh, what the index is. I mean, uh, basically, um, it's um, degree of uh, certain map. So if you, if you look at the small ball around that fixed point, this map F sends the ball to itself, actually sends a sphere to a sphere, the boundary of the ball to, its, to another sphere. And that map has a degree, assuming uh, you have oriented manifold. So you take degree of that map to be index of this uh, fixed point. That's one definition. But okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, where that uh, comes from. So apply a tier bot to uh, the wrong complex. So the wrong complex, of course, is an elliptic complex, right? That's uh, our first example of an elliptic complex was the wrong complex. So we have one with a zero of m, one of m, n of m, right? Now, here is a kind of lucky situation because if you have a map f from m to m, you do get maps where pullback goes from this to itself. So, this map f in this case is very easy. So, f from m to m, of course, gives you map f pullback goes from omega i m to omega i m. I mean, the pullback of a differential form is a differential form. We can pull back differential forms. So there is something interesting happening in this case, which is not shared by general manifolds, but that's general vector bundles. That you know why. So we can go for all i. Okay. Now. Um, the right hand side of the formula, let's look at the right hand side of the formula. Uh, this side. So now we are, we, are, we are changing, we are replacing this whole number, some q from zero to n, by just a sign. We are replacing this whole kind of huge set of numbers here, a sum from zero to n, but by this number, by, by, by just a sign. Well, why that's the case? Uh, what happens in this case? Well, this is just, uh, a, a, it's, it's, it's a linear algebra fact. So let me write it. Again, we need another linear algebra fact. So it's always linear algebra, it seems. Linear algebra fact. Is the following. So imagine you have a map from finite dimensional vector space to itself. So, I mean, just to, to choose another map, uh, I, I will call maybe A from V to V. So these are finite dimensional vector spaces. You can take the um, exterior power of A acting on exterior powers to exterior power, right? Take the i exterior power of A going from i exterior power of B to i exterior power of B. So um, i less than equal to D bigger than equal to zero at this dimension of B, say over R, doesn't matter. Okay, so, so now the claim is that uh, this determinant of one minus A determinant is equal to alternating sums minus one to the power i is trace of these guys. A 
So, so this is this is the claim. Yeah. Right. This is the claim. Um, now, proving this is not difficult. Proving this is not difficult. Why? Uh, you can assume. So let, let's assume this guy is diagonal, for example. Let's assume it's diagonal. What happens in the diagonal case? You are multiplying these numbers one minus lambda r. So let me let me then give you the idea of the proof. And A is right. So uh, A is diagram. Just uh, just just to practice. Then left hand side you have a product of one minus lambda r. Well, you can write product of one minus lambda i's as what? As one minus sums plus products of the things like So it's just one. Uh, what's the next term? Uh, the next term is going to be, um, is it minus sums of uh, lambda i's? I suppose, yeah. Minus sum of lambda i plus sum. Of uh, minus sums of lambda i plus sums of lambda i lambda j's i uh, is less than j uh, plus minus, minus sum of lambda i lambda j lambda k i less than j less than k i hope I'm okay plus plus minus one to the d um, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda d, right? And if you look at this guy, these are exactly traces of uh, uh, action of this guy on exterior powers. Okay, so this proves the, uh, the thing for diagonal. Um, and of course, because the two sides are invariant on their similarities, so it's also true for diagonalizables, you can say. It's also true for diagonalizable object. Now, can we use a density argument? For example, I say the set of all diagonalizable operators. So what, a, I mean, it's dense. Yes, I can do that, right? The reason is that the set of all operators with distinct eigenvalues, or they have to be self, self adjoint. Otherwise, they are not. Uh, is it true that a uh, complex matrix with distinct eigenvalues is diagonalizable? No, yeah, that's not true. It has to be normal. Oh, yeah, it's got to be normal. Uh, otherwise, it's not. Uh, um, the distinct eigenvalues that Jordan calls it for. Yeah. So it should be also normal. It's normal. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, uh, if, if it is upper diagonal, the up, upper triangular, that's okay. Because in this calculation, everything that you use is on, on the, the computing determinant, if, you, if you're making this upper triangular, in the sense that this lower triangle is zero, then, then so this is this is correct. This is correct. I mean, you can uh, you can give maybe different proofs, but the proof that uh, just is okay. Now uh, look, this map J uh, for the wrong complex is just uh, this uh, action uh, of uh, this differential. We just pick that to be the, just the differential. E F X. At, at Q, or okay, in using uh, so, in other words, so so what what happens is that so the right hand side now, okay, so for each x point x um, trace of sum minus one to the power of Q. Trace of Bf uh, um, Q, I mean the exterior power really of 
this guy from uh, base Q of T uh, star mx to itself, right? Minus one, did did it over that determinant. Absolute value of the determinant is, is in the formula, not the determinant itself. But this is just a determinant, right? So the determinant divided by absolute value of the determinant is just sine of the determinant. This turns out to be the sine of the determinant. Determinant of one minus uh, f. Yes. Right. So the right hand side simplifies drastically to just sign of the determinant of one minus f. Uh, by understanding what J map in this case is, the J map is really you just take the action of um, f on uh, exterior powers of uh, cotangent bond, which it does. And that's what I take, and that's uh, now we have to look at the left hand side and independently define uh, the index, um, these things that I define on the left hand side. And uh, then the result is a consequence of uh, Atiyabat, because uh, what did Atiyabat said? It just said that the action of F on, uh, on uh, the left shift's number is uh, given, which is action on the cohomology is given by. Oh, yeah, this thing. So I think we should just stop and uh, discuss uh, next time because already it's like two hours. So okay. So I'll stop the video and then we can discuss. Any questions or comments before I stop? I don't really understand how um, how the J's work. Okay, so yeah. Oh, how J's work, okay. Um, you see, uh, I mean, this J is really, um, so for example, JQ is, I mean, there's this point of X also, but this is really essentially um, pullback um, by, by, by this differential, so I mean, so uh, I don't want to write this. So this is really F star. So pull back by differential forms. I mean, pull back of differential forms. You see, F goes from M to N. So I mean, there is this map F star. Which uh, goes from uh, um, cotangent bond to cotangent bond uh, from uh, F star from from T star. And it certainly goes from C infinity of T star, but but I need it on, on the level of. Uh, Fibers also. Um, so we'll, we'll figure this out. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. So certainly, I mean, certainly, I mean, let me just write it like this. And then exterior powers, but then uh, I have to tell you what this on this level is that big. So I think uh, we have to finish now. So.